So now to talk about mass spectroscopy, which comes up really twice during the course. First of all, very early on, talking about isotopes of um, elements, and then later on being used as an analytical device for particularly organic chemistry. So anyway, the first part of this first question, principal parts in one type of mass spectrometer, you throw in your vaporized sample, you ionize it. So now you've got some um, cations floating around, which then get drawn, diverted by the electromagnet and detected. OK, that's something we'll talk about a bit later on. But while we've got the picture here, if the iron is really, really heavy, it's hard to deflect it. And so it will not be deflected as much. If the iron is highly charged, so say two plus instead of one plus, then it will be deflected quite a lot more because it's attracted more to the electromagnet. OK, so now we've got X is where X is going. And Y has a higher mass to charge ratio than X. Draw a line on the diagram to show the path of Y. Well, if Y is essentially heavier, right, higher mass to charge, it's going to be harder to deflect it. So therefore, it's not going to be deflected as much. So there we are, a feeble attempt to show you where Y might be. Without altering the shape of the mass spec, what change could you make to allow Y to pass through the sit, slit and be detected? Well, you've got to have it moving over a little bit more. You've got to deflect it a little bit more, which means you need to have a stronger magnet to deflect it. Incomplete mass spectrum for a sample of chlorine, Cl2. What iron is responsible for the peak at 74? So here's 70, 71, 72, 73, 74. Well, now if we got chlorine, you are supposed to know that chlorine has two isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So in Cl2, you could have both of the atoms of chlorine 35. One of them's 35, one's 37, the other way around, or both of them are chlorine 37. Okay, so looking at the masses, 70 there, so that's the peak for 70, 72, 72, and then 74. So which ion is responsible for 74? The Cl2, in which both of the chlorines are chlorine 37. Draw another peak you'd expect to see. You should show the mass to charge ratio, at which you would see the peak and the height of the peak. Well, the mass to charge, we already know, is going to be there at 72. So that's my pretty little line there. But the height of the peak, well, in order to do that, we have to start thinking about possibilities. Okay, three quarters of chlorine is chlorine 35 and one quarter is chlorine 37. So therefore, when you've got two chlorines, if the first one's 35, that's a three quarter chance. The second one, 35, is a three quarter chance. So the chances of this one here, three quarters times three quarters. For this one, again, chlorine 35, chance of the first one being chlorine 35 is three quarters, and the second one being chlorine 37 is a quarter. Chlorine 37 being first is a quarter, chlorine 35 is second being three quarters, and then finally, the first one being chlorine 37, and then the second chlorine being 37, a quarter and a quarter. So you multiply these out, and what you see is nine times out of 16, it's going to be 70. Six times out of 16, the mass is going to be 72, because there's two possibilities for that. And only one time in 16 is the mass 74. And you can kind of see that big ratio between 9 over 16 and 1 over 16 in what they've shown us. Now, what we want to do is draw this peak here, our nice one of 72, so that its height represents that 6 over 16. Now, this one here, 22.5. That represents 9 out of 16. Here's 2.5. That represents 1 out of 16. So therefore, 6 out of 16 will be 6 times that 2.5. So our peak height here will be 15. Okay, so 15 is 6 times the 2.5 because we've got 6 times 1, but it's only Two thirds as big as the 22.5 because that's six compared to nine. Hopefully I didn't overdo that and you can understand where we got that height from. Compound Z contains carbon hydrochlorine, analyzed, found to contain blah, 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 blah. So empirical formulas, we've got carbon, we've got chlorine, what's left is hydrogen, turn into mass in 100, turn into moles, turn into a nice ratio. So the empirical formula CHCl3. 
Now, that's the empirical formula. What we don't know is, is this also the molecular formula? Because the empirical formula is just the ratio. So the molecular one could be CHCl3, C2H2Cl6, C3H3Cl9, and so on. So in order to determine what the molecular formula was, in other words, which multiple of the empirical formula, we'd need to know the molar mass. Now you can get the molar mass via um, wet chemistry means, or you can hopefully get it from a mass spectrum, because if on that mass spectrum of the molecule, you have the molecular iron, that would be the most right-hand peak, the highest M over Z. Sometimes you don't see the molecular iron, but if you do see it, it's very nice because it immediately tells you what the molar mass is. Lithium discovered by Johann August Arfwedson. Name derives from lithium means stone, blah, 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 blah. Here we go. Naturally occurring lithium composed of two stable isotopes, lithium-6, lithium-7. In a mass spec, a sample of lithium must be ionized before it can be analyzed. How do we vaporize atoms, or how do we take vaporized atoms of lithium, which you get by heating lithium up to lithium ions, generally bombard it with high energy electrons. There are different methods, but the most common one, high energy electron bombarding. You don't want to put too much energy in because you don't want to knock out lots of electrons. You only want one electron knocked out. It's unlikely you knock out more than one, but that's what this question is getting to. And the difference of any between chemical properties isotopes well, the whole point of isotopes is that chemically they're the same because they have the same number of electrons and it is electrons that determine the behavior of atoms. Different isotopes you see in mass spectroscopy, you see in infrared spectroscopy, and then some kinetic effects. But as far as the what reacts with what, absolutely no difference. Now we got mass spectrum, natural current sample lithium, following results, we can get the relative atomic mass of the lithium sample. We can deal with percentages or we can deal with fractions. I prefer to deal with fractions because then you just pop it straight in. Mass is six times 0 0.0725 plus seven times 0 0.9275, which is 6.928. Which of lithium ions formed will be deflected more in the mass spectrometer? Well, the lower the mass, the more the deflection, because it's easier to deflect it. The higher the charge, the more the deflection. Generally, we assume we've only got lithium plus, so therefore the charge is not an issue. So that means that it will be the lithium-6 cation that is more deflected than the lithium-7, because lithium-7 is a little bit heavier. Moving on to silicon, where we got three isotopes, silicon 28, 29, and 30. The percentage of 28 was 92.2. Mass spectrum shows that the 29 was twice that of the 30. Calculate the relative atomic mass. So the isotope 28, 29, 30, percentage 92.2, we know for 28. And we know that if X, 30, if 30 is X, well then 29 is 2X. Well, all of these have to add up to 100. So 92.2 plus 3x is 100, 3x is 7.8, x is 2.6. So thus the final fractions, 9.922 for 28, 2x, which is 5.2, turn it to a fraction 0 0.052, and x, which is 2.6, turn it to a fraction 0 0.026. Pop that into the equation in which we just take for each isotope, its mass times its fraction, add those together, and we get 28.1. Mass spectrum bromine trifluoride shows two molecular ion peaks equal intensity at 136 and 138. What can be deduced about the relative isotopic masses of the bromine atoms present and their percent abundances? Well, first of all, you got bromine, you got fluorine in here, but fluorine is dedicated 19, only 19, which is, of course, fluorine anyway. There's only one stable isotope of fluorine, which weighs 19. So the differences between these then is nothing to do with the fluorine. It is only to do with the bromine. Now, three fluorines weighs 57. So that means the one at 136 is 136 minus the 57, which is the fluorine. So that's 79 bromine. And the 138, 138 minus the 57 for the fluorines, so that's 81 bromine. Okay, 
Now, the fact they're equal intensity tells you that they are of equal abundance. So in other words, half the molecules in there are bromine 50, sorry, bromine 79, and half the molecules are bromine 81. So last three questions in this section, we're going to organic compounds, max spectrum of octane, 2,3-dione, there it is right there, shows fragmentation peaks at 99.71.43. Identify the species responsible for these peaks. Well, when you've got oxygen in there, one of the best places for the species to break is the bond to the carbon that contains the oxygen. So let's look first of all at fragmentation there, and then we'll look at fragmentation there. So first of all there, so those two patterns there, you've got this hydrocarbon fragment there that will go like that, and then you've got what's left here, um, although of course this will be an acyllium iron, but I'm not going to draw it as that so much because we're just fragmenting it, giving us what's left. Mass of this is C5H11, C3H3O2, weighs 71, weighs 71. Wow, so what we did was we just split the mass of the molecule in half, giving us the peak at 71. Now let's try breaking it here. When we do that, we get this acyllium iron there, and we get the fragment that's left over there. This is C6H11O, this is C2H3O, which weigh 99 and 43 respectively. So there are the species responsible for those peaks. Australian cockroach protects itself from tack, spraying predators with a nasty unsaturated compound. Analysis, which is not cyclic. So first of all, empirical formula, we've got the carbon hydrogen, the rest is oxygen, turn that into grams, turn into moles, turn into ratio. There is the empirical formula, C5H8O. And we're told it's only one oxygen atom in each molecule. Well, there's one oxygen atom in the empirical formula, which must mean that the molecular formula must be the same. Now, when you've got five carbons, you expect there to be 12 hydrogens. So we're four short of that, which means two levels of unsaturation. Now, that could be rings or extra bonds, except we're told there's no rings. So we've got two extra bonds in there. Molecule gives a silver mirror with Tollens reagent. That tells you it's an aldehyde. So one of the levels of unsaturation is the carbon-oxygen double bond in the aldehyde. So the other one, just a carbon-carbon double bond. Mass spectrum shows a fragmentation iron with carbon and hydrogen at 29. Hopefully you recognize that as being an ethyl group, C2H5. So putting it all together, we've got five carbons. One of them's in the aldehyde. We then have a carbon-carbon double bond and an ethyl group at the end of something. So that means the carbon-carbon double bond has to be next. And then the ethyl group can be either on carbon three or carbon two. Cool, that was a fun one. I do like problems like that. Mass spectrum of DEET shows molecular iron at 191. So the molar mass is 191. Shows a prominent peak at 91. Suggests a formula for a fragment that's lost. So the remaining fragment is the 91. Well, if the whole molecule is 191 and the fragment of interest is 91, what's lost must have a mass of 100. Now we look at the structure here and remember the best place when you've got oxygens in there is the bond attached to the carbon that's bonded to the oxygen. So let's see what would happen if we break it here. And so we get this fragment and that fragment. Add that up, that's C7H7 plus, and that weighs 91. So this must weigh C5H10NO, must weigh 100. So this is the fragment that is lost so that you get this nice fragment at 91.